1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 33 in the Christian Standard Bible say, What then, brothers and sisters, whenever you come together, each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything is to be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, there are to be only two, or at most three, each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no interpreter, that person is to keep silent in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should evaluate. But if something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. And the prophet's spirits are subject to the prophets, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Here, St. Paul is warning the church of Corinth not to overemphasize the gift of speaking in unknown tongues, claiming this gift as a sign for believers, while prophecy is a better gift as it is edifying and serves as a sign for unbelievers. After this warning, St. Paul here describes how a church should order itself with the spiritual gifts. Christian Ashley, how can church order and spiritual gifts work together for the body, building up the body of the church today? Well, right there, you got to figure out what are my gifts first before any of that, because, I mean, the church is dependent on the gifts of the people within it. Is it organization? Is it uh, evangelism? Is it preaching? Is it mercy or what have you? Like, learn what those are, seek them out, then go to people who figured out theirs and then figure out where best you're supposed to be. I mean, I think the key part of that uh, passage earlier was God is not a God of disorder. Like God is supposed to be someone who brings order and human beings by very natures don't bring that to the table. So I think we all need to learn how we can bring order into a world filled with disorder. What is up, guys? Welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, hopefully your favorite church unity podcast. I am your co-host. Um, technically, I might be your only host today. Um TJ Blackwell, and I am joined by the wonderful MCA, the wise, the powerful Christian Ashley. How are oh, you doing, you, TJ? I'm doing pretty well, man. Uh, I'm a little tired from journeying to back to Louisville from Chicago way, but you know what? It was worth it. Yeah, yeah. You know, not a couple of nice places, Chicago, Louisville. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool, cool. I don't. I still personally don't agree with how Louisville is allegedly pronounced. Uh, <laughs> But well, don't say that over here. They, they might beat you with a stick. Yeah, I've heard. That's what they're known for, you know, the Louisville Slugger. Yep. Louisville. Anyway, so we're going to talk about Jeconiah's curse today. You've been going through Luke on your show. Mm-hmm. And you just, you know, kind of covered this yourself. So who better than a guy who does not know much about Jeconiah's curse? <laughs> and you, who has just become fairly familiar with it. So if you're new here, if you're not new here and you've just kind of stubborn, um, check out the Anazal Ministries podcast, the AMP Network website. Uh, link is below. Uh, there's a bunch of shows on there, a bunch of cool, godly shows. Uh, not necessarily godly, but, you know, God given, God led. Uh, there's also a paid subscription for the network on Apple Podcasts where you can get extra content from all of the shows instead of like going through and individually supporting all the patrons. It's 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 pretty nice. Check out our Discord server and check out our merch. There's some cool stuff on there. Nice stuff to wear to bed. They're all pretty comfy. So, Christian. Yes. Josh, sadly, is not with us. Uh, Very true. He's beset by uh, a sinus infection and also was in Kentucky. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot. He's got a lot going on. So it's just us mm-hmm. today. But his favorite form of unity perseveres. Our silly question today. If you could have any mech or mecha other than Optimus Prime, which is a silly stipulation, but I think that might be the only one he knows. Uh, (laughs) If you could have any mech or mecha do your lawn work for a year when you get your first home, which one would you choose? I will go first. That's yeah. yeah, Go ahead. Go ahead. I got to. I have to. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm going to say Gundam Wing. V. Okay. Yeah. The Heroes. Yeah, heroes. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, gotta be. And if anything goes wrong, you can just blow it up. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I know I, I assume he's just going to do a nice job. My yard's not going to be that big. It's a starter home. Uh, pretty much just one swing, I think, we'll, we'll get it done. There you go. And then he can handle his own business. Yeah, I, I struggled with this one. As someone who is very against the idea of lawns, I think they're terrible for the environment and a lot of work put into something that looks pretty, and that's about it. Uh, so in the in the essence of actually answering the question, I'll go with my joke answers first, and I'll get my actual one. Uh, my first joke answer would be the Edeon from Space Runaway Edeon, which uh, I could just blow up the entire solar system, and then I wouldn't have to deal with the lawn. But that would cause untold death and devastation, so I suppose I can't do that. Well, next would be the Turn A Gundam from Turn A Gundam. I'd just mm-hmm. activate the Moonlight Butterfly and send everyone back to pre-industrial revolution times. Uh, but unfortunately, that would also cause a lot of death and destruction, which uh, is a lot to just get rid of a lawn, unfortunately. Uh, so my real answer would actually be the Logon from Gurren Lagon, just so I could sit inside of the cockpit, get away from the sun and all the evils of the outside world and just get my gardening done with it. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to say uh, this is calling out Josh, who wrote the question. Uh, Transformers aren't mechs. <laughs> they're, he's they're learning. Sentient. He's learning. They're like, they're creatures. Anyway. Yeah, they're sapient. There's, yeah, they're like the whole thing. Uh, so, Christian, Ashley, you've been on the show quite a bit, especially more recently when Josh or myself have been unavailable. Uh, what can you tell the audience about yourself that they might not already know? That's going to be a tough one, too, to answer. Um, I always, when questions are asked about me, I kind of freeze and go, wait, what's interesting about me? And I know there are answers, but I struggle to find them. So uh, stuff I haven't brought up in the show before, like I've brought up that I'm a writer, I brought up that I'm big into geeky stuff. That's why I keep coming for the systematic stuff, obviously, as one of the co-hosts there. Uh, I'm in seminary, so people know that about me. But what they might not know about me is, well, I also, I DM for our group there for Dungeons & Dragons. So I know a lot of people are like conservative. One of the most conservative people there is playing Dungeons & Dragons and actually running it. Yes, absolutely. I see no contradiction there. It's a lot of good fun. Uh, TG, we've what, done two sessions so far? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, nobody's cried running away yet. No one's summoned any demons. So I think we're doing a pretty fair job on that regard. Yeah, none of the player characters have summoned any <laughs> Very true. Um, other things, like I, I am into sports. I mean, that's something I really bring up a lot. Uh, if a college basketball game is on or an NFL game is on, like I'm in it to win it. Let's watch what's going on. Like I have my teams, like I have Duke and I have the Carolina Panthers. But I mean, I'm open to watching most anything. So that's something they may not know. And I guess sticking to scripture, like uh, my favorite book of the Bible is the book of James. So that's probably something most people didn't know about me. Hmm. I pegged you for a Titus kind of man. Uh, I do like Titus, but it's not near the top. Hmm. So you run your own podcast on the AMP network. Uh, it's called Let Nothing Move You. Uh, what can you tell our audience about the inspiration behind Let Nothing Move You and what the show's about? Well, speaking uh, speaking on you know spiritual gifts earlier, I mean, my main one is teaching and I have really enjoyed over the years cultivating that talent and using it to help people. I've worked with fifth and sixth graders before teaching them. Uh, I've worked off and on with high schoolers doing that with them. But uh, before I went to seminary, I was in charge of a small group at one of my churches for two years. And I loved it because it gave me one time every week I could go through a couple chapters of the Bible because one of my members there, uh, of the group, he had not read through the entire Bible. So I said, well, why don't we do that together? And unfortunately, I left when we got to first Samuel, actually no second Samuel. So didn't quite get to the goal there, but he has since read on without me. So I'm very happy about that. But when I came here to seminary, I kind of lost that. I want that feeling again of being able to teach, being able to have an audience that's like learning for the first time. Some of them, like, what does this mean? Who are these characters? Why did God allow these things to happen? What what does he want me to learn from this? And like, I, you know, I just joined a church up here, but like, I can't just walk into that church and say, hey, uh, you don't really know me that well. Sure. Thanks for the membership, but I'm Christian Ashley. You should let me lead a Bible study. It's like, not quite how that works. And even my egotistical side, I just can't do that. So I figured I've been doing this for you guys. Uh, guessed it in the whole church first and then on systematic and like, I really enjoyed doing it. So why didn't I just do it myself? 
and just create a podcast. And if people listen, people listen. And it's not like I'm nowhere near on the, I don't know, New York Times have like a top list of podcasts mm-hmm. or anything like that. I think they might actually. Okay. I'm definitely not on the list. Not even anywhere close. But it's so much fun. I, I, even on talking to an invisible audience, like I get to like get into things that I normally wouldn't because I just brush over them, but I'm looking deeper into the text. And it's caused things like what we're going to be talking about later for me to focus on because no one had ever brought it up to me before. So that's why I do what I do, not only for to teach other people, but for me to keep learning myself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, there's so I've always thought there's something to be said about the slippery slope fallacy. I don't think it's that much of a fallacy. You know, you dip your toes in the podcast waters a little and then boom, you start one. <laughs> That's totally fair. It's a pretty consistent pattern. That's, just, that's all I'm saying. Uh, so what would you say makes your show stand out from other Bible podcasts? Well, to be fair, I don't listen to that many that like do what I do. And I should have talked about earlier. Like I go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, I started in the book of Luke and we'll talk about that in a second. But as far as that is concerned, like other Bible podcasts, like I do a lot of research uh, beyond what I'm supposed to do. And I do try to incorporate that as best as possible in there without it being like me lecturing you about stuff. Because I've listened to some like that. It's just like, oh, you're just speaking at me. You're not speaking you know, to me about like, hey, how can I apply this? What can I do with that? What is, what is God trying to say here for me, this human who lives 2,000 plus years when it was originally written, you know, to understand what's going on? And that's what I want is for people to ask, God wrote this. It meant something then. He had an original meaning. What does it also mean for me now? because he knew I'd be reading this however the heck many years after it first came into print. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you started in Luke. You're still in Luke. Where are you in Luke? I will be recording Luke 20 tomorrow. So as far as episodes are concerned, when I'm saying this out loud, I just, I've gone through Luke one through 19. I am just about, uh, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem on the donkey and he's about to confront the Pharisees for one of the final times in 20. And that's when they really double down on their idea of, we oh, got to get rid of this guy because he's taking people away from us and taking away our power. Mm-hmm. All right. So enough about you. Uh, let's talk about us. Uh, every so often we do our own series here on the whole church called Dividing Scriptures. Uh, it, I think like, it's been a little while since we've done one. Uh, but we go through and discuss sections of scripture that have caused the most debate in the church throughout time to see whether we think it's possible to disagree about some of them and still maintain unity in the church. By and large, so far, the answer is yes. We hope to continue that. Um, In your series on Luke, you've recently came across Jeconiah's curse. What can you tell us about it and where it's found in the scripture? Well, yeah, um, one of the reasons I picked up on it in the first place is because it's not one of the most hotly debated things within the church. I had never once heard of this thing before. And I, TJ shaking his head for those of you, God, I think we're le- releasing this visually. Uh, and I, that's a very common response because what the heck, who, who is Jeconiah? Why would he be cursed? And what's going on here? Like I had never once heard before I started going into commentary after commentary to make sure I had my facts straight with everything. Then I came upon this apparent contradiction in scripture. So I guess to lay some groundwork here, uh, right before Judah, which is the last kingdom of Israel, got taken away uh, by the Babylonians, there were very evil kings. Jeconiah or Kaniah or Jehoiakim, as is often the case back then, you had more than one name, especially if you were rich. So we're talking about the same person, those three names are one guy. He was king of Israel, a very wicked man, and Jeremiah is speaking against him. Uh, God is using Jeremiah to speak his words against Jeconiah because of his wickedness. And in Jeremiah 22, what he brings up is this fact that he is never going to reign over Israel again. And uh, from the wording used, it seems like his descendants won't either. Well, if we're looking at our genealogies in Matthew... We go, okay, 
Abraham, blah, 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 David, blah, 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 you know, Solomon, so on and so forth. And then you see Jeconiah's name there. So how is that possible that Jesus can come from that line and reign as king of Israel if God said that you can't? No descendant will ever do that. So I had this rush of, I have never once heard this in my life. Were people trying to hide this from me? Were, uh, were they afraid that if, if I looked in too much, like I would you know, give up on Christianity because this is the one contradiction that destroys everything? And I came to the point of realization is like, no one knows about this because no one speaks about it because they're not aware it's an issue because no one reads the Old Testament as much as they should. So I'm looking there. I'm going through everything. Okay, what does this mean? Because uh, was it Luke 3 or 4 when he goes to the genealogy? Because it is not in Luke's genealogy. I'll get to that in a second. So how do I reconcile these two differences here? Like, how can God curse Jeconiah to never have someone to become king, and yet Jesus is obviously supposed to be king not only of Israel but the world? Well, let's look at the facts. And... I poured through commentary after commentary, which very few talked about it. So that was a lot of fun. Until I came to, there's like three things people say, this could possibly be the answer. I mean, those three things being like, um, it, it's possible that we look at the different genealogies and the genealogy we get for Luke, Jack and I isn't mentioned. And instead, Jesus is descended from Nathan, son of David instead of Solomon, son of David, like we see in Matthew. What well, is a contradiction in itself? Well, how can both be true? Well, the early church fathers had plenty to say about that. And it's because Matthew is talking about Joseph, his legal guardian. Even though his stepfather, even though he's not his biological father, that's where the authority comes from, from him. Luke is talking about Mary and her descendants, from which we get the actual biological Jesus is here on the way, which if you'll notice there, Jeconiah is not one of them. That's one possible answer. Uh, the other one, well, one of the other two would be that, uh, oh gosh, I've lost my point there. Yeah. This offspring that's kind of mentioned in that verse in Jeremiah, it's kind of ambiguous of what the language is actually saying in the original Hebrew and as someone who studied Hebrew, I'm still cross-eyed in that regard. So I don't blame anyone who gets confused about this. It could mean his offspring forever. It could mean his offspring that are alive at that time. Or it could just be a metaphor. And like, uh, your ambitions are gone. Even if you had children along the way, they wouldn't like be yours, even though biologically they are. So there's some ambiguity there. That's not my preferred one. I think my preferred was the first one I said. Uh, but actually, there's also a really cool one as well, in that there's this idea that God himself got rid of the curse. As we see along the way, uh, once the Israelites come back into Judah slash Israel from the exile, we see Zerubbabel, who is the grandson of, of Jeconiah take control of Israel. Well, how is that possible if God has cursed them to never reign again? Well, God reversed the curse is what some people would argue. We see in Haggai, there's this instance of, uh, well, actually first in uh, Jeremiah, there's this imagery of the signet ring, like showing imperial royal power that God is taking away from Jeconiah. But in Haggai, we see him return that to him. So there's people out there say, well, oh, that can't be possible because, you know, God's not going to reverse a curse. And I kind of look at them in these commentaries that would say this because that's literally what God and Jesus did on the cross is reverse the ultimate curse. So you're king, he, he can't do this for this one simple thing that God cursed. I don't buy it. So that's where we stand. There's a lot of talking. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he is God, so he can kind of do um, whatever. So there's that. Uh, but is it possible for people who read the Bible with the same literal inerrant perspective as you to disagree about the interpretation of this curse? So I pointed out three of the major ones. I think 
I, I forgot to look at the minor ones before I got back into this one, but out of those three, none necessarily contradict each other. Uh, you can have a spot where God reverses the curse and he still intends for the Nathan line of David instead of the Solomon line of David to be the actual how Jesus gets his true uh, rulership over the Israelites. Um, so I don't necessarily see it as something that like we can have to disagree on. Like as long as we get to that point that God did something or arrange things to where that oh, doesn't apply to Jesus, I'm golden. Hmm. No. So is it possible to still have unity and disagree about this biblical contradiction? In that way, yes. In that everyone is in those circles, those three main ones I talked about is trying to find an answer to this. And they're using it using scripture itself. Like how many people do you ever see talking about the book of Haggai uh, in your life? Nobody. Like, yeah. Next to no one. And the only reason that we're able to do any of this to have this conversation is that people did their work. I wouldn't have known that off the top of my head because I didn't know about the curse of Jeconiah to begin with, but someone smarter than me came in, talked about it, didn't shy away from it, which to me was one of the big things I had really early on recording for the podcast for Let Nothing Move You was, do I ignore this because no one's going to know what I'm talking about anyway? Or do I confront it? and actually do my research myself. Like, well, no one would ever know it was an issue except for me. Because like I said before, very few people know this is a thing. But in my heart of hearts, I like, I couldn't ignore it. I had to bring it up because I don't want to shy away from something. I want to have legitimate discussions about what scripture is, what it means for all of us. And if there's looks like there's a contradiction in the Bible as someone who takes a very literal inerrant, and I guess I should specify what I mean by an errant real quick, because I know there's the, the ultra conservative side where we have one to one, the original Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. And I'm of the slightly, slightly to the left of that, where it's, I think as time has went on, we've lost some of the original meaning, but as far as translating something from ancient Hebrew, Greek, uh, Aramaic into Latin, into English, we're about as close as we're going to get. That's my view of inerrancy. Mm-hmm. So have you encountered how more progressive Christians who might not subscribe to a doctrine of inerrancy interpret the scripture? Uh, for the most part in my research, I found a lot of people on that side just didn't care. And, which makes a lot of sense uh, from where they're coming from. It's like, uh, and I don't want to like speak for them in this regard. I want to create a straw man out of them. But from what I got from most of the arguments I saw, it's like, well, I mean, it doesn't matter because uh, Jesus is who he says he is, or this is how I interpret it. So it doesn't matter if the Bible itself has contradictions as long as Jesus is, you know, Jesus. Which I, I see the viewpoint, but, and that's not the only one. I, I can't remember off the top of my head the other ones, but that's the main one I saw. It's like, it doesn't matter anyways, because uh, the Bible is is a mishmash of people from over to generations who just created it in their view, in their point of view. Mm -hmm. Some of them. Right. So what about Hebrew or Muslim readers of the Old Testament? How do they interpret the scripture? That is an excellent question because there's actually a ton. And I am so angry because I couldn't find the actual Hebrew sources themselves. I just saw people cite them without actually naming them. Mm. Which I don't know how you get away with that. You just in your articles you get to add on the bibliography. Yeah. It, it's so easy. fairly, yeah, fairly annoying. So what the in several Jewish sources written uh, a little after the exile, from what we can tell, and from as time has gone on, they notice the same discrepancies. It's like, oh, well, the Messiah has to come from the line of David. So how is this possible? Well, what they see is they kind of take the uh, God reversing the curse option, and they write stories of Jeconiah while he is in exile, like slowly coming to faith in God and repenting of who he is. So we don't see this in the biblical canon that we have. So this could certainly have been a possibility, but most of the Jewish takes I've seen on this is that uh, we had to write about this. So I don't know if they're fabricating it. I don't know if this is actual history. So I guess that itself is just a matter of faith on whether or not Jeconiah or Kaniah or what have you actually realized the evil he had done and turned back to God. 
Mm. So and God then reversed the curse because of his uh, turning to him in faith. Right. So what, what makes your interpretation more likely to be correct than these others? Um, well, I mean, obviously we're going to have a hard time arguing with, with someone who is more uh, not as literal as I am because it's kind of incompatible in certain regards. But for me, when I look at this text and I, and I believe in my heart of hearts that God has preserved it as best as possible for us to read right now and to get the fullness of what he intended from the beginning. Like the, the perks of having my point of view is that you once again, see that no matter what people say, no matter what they try and weasel out of words and what have you, the Bible remains pure and holy and untouched by impure human thoughts and ideas. It is his original word where what he intended to say is, is said. So that brings me a lot of peace and stability. I know for other people, they don't look at it the same way, and that's just fine for them. Mm-hmm. Right. So in general, do you believe that you're open to being wrong or seeing things in a different way if you encounter new information? Well, encountering new information is one of my favorite things in the world uh, because obviously I'm a very opinionated person, and I double down sometimes too bad for my own good. But like, I mean, that's what I was talking about earlier. This was new information to me. I could have easily just ignored it and said, oh, well, the Bible is near it. Therefore, I have to think about that. And I know there are plenty of people out there. That's as far as their logic goes. And that's not good enough for me. I got I'm like a a dog chasing a car. When I see it, I got to find it and I got to bite onto it and figure it out. And I would say, hopefully, that I am open to being wrong, open to amending what I believed before. I mean, uh, there are plenty of things. Like, I used to think that uh, the angel of the Lord was just an angel. Now I've come to see it as a pre-incarnate Christ. And like, if you had argued with me 10 years ago, I would have had a completely different argument than I do now. And that was just based on new evidence brought to a friend of mine, uh, to me by a friend of mine who... Uh, say, well, how do you interpret this then? So you go, oh, well, I didn't interpret that way, but I see this in a new light now. And plenty of other things. I mean, politically, I mean, I mean, we talked about it before on uh, some of the political stuff we're starting to do for systematic ecology. I am uh, at my youngest, when I was just starting to be able to vote, a very jingoistic conservative guy. And like, uh, anyone who crosses the border, they're going to be deported. Anyone like that, they're, they're worthless, they're trash. And over the years, as I start reading more into the Gospels, seeing God's heart in the law that given to the Israelites about the foreigner and the sojourner, I go, wait, I can't have that point of view. I can believe that as a country we need to keep tighter borders, but I then don't see that person who illegally goes over as a parasite, as someone who deserves to be looked at with scorn. So I had to learn over time. I can't hold that same truth if I hold that Jesus is who he says he is. Well, Jesus would not be the person who said, oh, you crossed over. Therefore, I can do whatever I want to you. or I can send you back. It's like I'm more of the belief now of just uh, if you've proven this entire time that you've, you've crossed the borders, you've paid your taxes, what have you, you might as well just become a citizen. I'm OK with amnesty in that regard, because uh, if anything, I'm one of a I, I'm a do wrong, right kind of person. So. If you do it well and you do it productively, I'm okay with letting you slide. Yeah. And that's something I had to learn over time. Yeah, you know, I mean, move here, start paying taxes. You're a citizen as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that test is dumb. So what would it take for you to oh change gosh. your interpretation of this scripture or your view on inerrancy? I wrestled with this question too, because uh, for everyone who remembers uh, the first time this was brought up with our Tom, Dr. Ord, like my answer was God would literally have to come down and say, you have it wrong. And I don't mean that tongue in cheek. I don't mean that to like give a non answer, but, and I also don't want to rely on that answer, but at the same time, it's really the only thing that could totally convince me that right here. And now this is the only way this can be interpreted. Would God say, no, it's not. Here's how it actually is. So, uh, some people may feel that's a cop out, but that's where I'm at. Yeah. How funny would it be, though, if one day the clouds part 
It's God. He's just Christian. Yes, Lord. Not all of the Bible was right. Sometimes I was just <laughs> messing around in there. It would completely destroy <laughs> my, my my understanding of the Trinity. But you know what? If he says it, it has to be true because he cannot lie. Yeah. Well, he could. Uh, you know what? It's a different conversation. Uh, so, for you, are the issues of this interpretation and biblical inerrancy and the implications about Jesus more of a first, second, or third tier issue? I would say the issue of Jeconiah's curse itself is more second or third. Like, it's if it affects your salvation, I mean, you probably weren't ever going to be his anyways. I, I just hate to say that, but that's that's where it's at. Um, the biblical inerrancy, like, obviously I'm very, you know, pro inerrancy, but like, I'm not going to look at someone who interprets the Bible more liberally than me and say, you don't believe in Jesus Christ. Like if God has done a mighty work in their life and they have chosen instead of their minds to see the Bible in a different way while not hurting anyone, while not doing anything to cause harm to themselves, like that's where God has them right now. And they may come to my side. Someone from my side may come to theirs. Who knows? I don't because I'm not him. At the end of the day, he's the one who saved them, not me. Right. And if you're, uh, uh, if you're listening, you're unfamiliar with our tier system. Uh, essentially, we've got our little pyramid going on uh, for issues about unity. Tier one is the only tier an issue can fall in where disagreeing means we are not brothers in Christ. Tier two means you can't go to the same church comfortably. And tier three means like it might be an issue, but you can like sit next to each other at church. It's not that big of a deal. And honestly, I'd say for the implications about Jesus, if you choose to interpret it as Jesus being illegitimate, then that's a tier one issue. Like there is no way I can comfortably allow you into a church and s preach that from the pulpit or uh, believe that and uh, say it to other people because it completely destroys the concept of who Jesus is. God has given him that birthright to be king of Israel, to be the redeemer. And for him to lose that in any way would destroy kind of everything we believe. Right. So uh, is there anything else, you know, related to this scripture in particular or let nothing move you that you'd like to bring up before we yeah. get into gritty? I mean, if you've enjoyed how I've interpreted like this one thing that most people skip over and you want more, like, please head on over. I am more than willing to have everyone listen and see how I look at things because I do my best. I'm not always good at it, but I do my best to like bring points that I don't personally believe in, but other people bring up about scripture as well. I forgot to mention that earlier. And then once again, attempt to not make them straw men simply because I disagree with them, but actually show the legitimacy of why they believe what they believe and then bring points to why I believe what I believe. So if that intrigues you head on let, over to let nothing move you, you're more than welcome. Right. And You've been here before. You know how we do things. We always ask our guests if they had to provide one tangible action to help engender Christian unity. What is one practical thing our listeners could go do right this second? If when reading your scripture, you're reading your Bible, you come across something that you don't understand. Or that makes you question things. If you look at that, uh, what's that one verse in Judges? Ah, I can never remember it off the top of my head. It's like 117 or something like that, where it, depending on how it's it, interpreted or sorry, translated, it says God could not overcome the iron chariots of the Canaanites or something to that effect. And you go, wait a minute, how could God not overcome a human device? Well, you're looking at that. You don't know where to go. Uh, is God suddenly weak? Did he forget to put the perks into his the skill level tree to overcome iron chariots? Does God have fey or something like that? Like, how do you wrestle with that? Well, if you just stay there and you ignore it, you're doing yourself a disservice. If you ask the wrong people the right questions, you're doing yourself a disservice. Find people if you have questions who you know you can trust, who you know are going to be looking after you, 
and then be the same for others after you've gained the knowledge you have when they come to you. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. What would, uh, what would the repercussions in the world around us be if everyone did that every time they saw something in the Bible where they're like, Hmm, what? I think it would remove a lot of fear from people of, I don't want to be seen as I'm not a good enough Christian because I don't understand this, or I don't want them thinking I'm questioning my faith. Like you should. I mean, I've brought it up plenty of times before. Question this. Don't just accept it because you've gone to church your entire life. Don't accept it because your spouse wants you to go to church. Like figure it out, ask questions, be bold so that people know it's okay to ask questions because shutting down answers is horrible practice. Like, uh, imagine if you went to school and every teacher you had said, this is two plus two equals four. And you asked, how is that possible? And they said, because I said so. That's not useful. Very unhelpful. Extremely so. Yes. So, Christian, where can we go to find Let Nothing Move You? Well, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, let's see, Captivate, Podchaser, I think as well, if I remember correctly. I'd have to look everything up on that end. But pretty much everywhere you can find AMP, you're going to be able to find me there too. So uh, check out all our shows there. They're a ton of good fun. Not everything I agree with too, but at that point, that's kind of the point of listening to them is see where the other people are coming from. I'm more than happy to do that. I Like I've said before, I don't want to live in an echo chamber. And it's incredibly easy to do it right now in the very conservative Southern Baptist campus, but that's not helpful and that's not fruitful. So if there's something you don't necessarily agree with what I have to say, well, just listen to me and see where I'm coming from. I'm more than happy to let someone do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of AMP, check us out. Podcast, Apple Podcast, or podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcast, (laughs) all of it. We're there. Check us out. Throw us a little money. Uh, our God moment before we start to wrap up. Uh, we always ask everyone to share a moment that they saw God in recently, whether it is a blessing or a challenge, a moment of worship, whatever it may be. If you saw God there, we want to hear about it. And I always make Josh go first. He has been kind enough to text me what his God moment would have been. Oh, good. So, uh, dealing with his sinus infection. Uh, it has become apparent to him that his God moment had to be the challenge to help our podcast ministries without breathing. (laughs) He did organize this little, you know, shebang for us, thankfully. So I wouldn't have to do this alone. So uh, I couldn't be more grateful. I would have rather taken a week off. (laughs) So I will go next. Because you are our esteemed guest, no matter how many times you guest on the show, the spot of honor is yours. And uh, for me, my God moment is going to be a good close friend of mine just recently was laid off on a Thursday. On Saturday, he spoke to a church about a student pastor position. And well, this was like this these past set of days. And today he is, he was moving into their parsonage. All right. So he also broke his foot today. <laughs> so you win some, you lose some. You win some, you lose some. You know, everything can't go that well all the time. <laughs> so you move into the new place with a broken foot. You know, it's not that much lost. So uh, what about you, Christian? Do you have a, a God moment for me this week? I most definitely do in the never ending saga of what is this baby going to be boy or girl? What is the baby's name? I can finally reveal the name of my niece, uh, Malin Hart Ashley. And I am calling her Mayday, which has gone over really well so far. And that little girl is my everything right now. I see Gosh, it's not even my own child. She's not even my own. And yet I feel this unending love and affection for this little girl that I know is nowhere close to how God feels about us. And yet, like, 
I want to give everything to this girl. I want to see her like raised up and be the, the tallest athlete or whatever, uh, the greatest uh, scholar in the land and just show her all the support I have to offer. And she is this little, like weighs next to nothing, little baby who sleeps way more often than babies normally do. She's a very good baby. I love my little Mayday. That's where I saw God a lot recently was going up to Chicago with my family to spend time with her. I had to relearn how to be patient. I had to relearn how to you know share because I didn't want to share my precious niece with anyone, but there's also plenty of other family members, not to mention her parents too, who would like to spend time with her. So uh, relearning patience was one way God challenged me. And I'll say also, last thing, because I always cheat here, mm-hmm. is my dad and I, well, uh, baby and her dad and mom were at a uh, doctor's visit. My dad and I went to go to a uh, comic book shop up there. I believe it's called Atlas, Atlas Comics. And we just had a blast because that's something we normally do together. Like normally for Hero Con, we go together. I couldn't do it this year because I'm up in seminary. Uh, so it is more than made up for it. Just uh, spending time with him and like uh, say, well, this is on the list. This isn't on the list. Let's not get that. We're just having fun together. And that's one of the ways we bond is through stuff like that. So getting to spend time with my dad like that was something I, I've been missing out on since I'm no longer home. So I really enjoyed seeing that. Right. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> so uh, if you enjoyed the episode, uh, please consider sharing it with a friend or an enemy. You can share it with a cousin. Lots of options. There are so many options. Um, if you're listening to this on the AMP Network YouTube channel, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you aren't, there's a like button on almost every other platform as well. Please just kind of smack that for us. And uh, again, check out our merch. I, I haven't seen like a stranger in public wearing our merch yet. I want that experience. So the more of you that buy it, like, the more likely it is that you're helping me fulfill my my deluded fantasies um, <laughs> check out all the other shows in the honest Al ministries podcast network on the website in the show notes to find about more thoughtful christian podcasts also upcoming not christian christian led hockey night in carolina will be coming soon that is tentative uh we're trying right. to to get that going um underserved market well, you know we'll just we just Can't wait for your support for that. But I hope you enjoyed the show. Come back next week. We'll be interviewing Pastor Will Rose about the Lutheran interpretation of the Eucharist. Then we'll be talking with Caitlin Scheiss about her newest book, The Ballot in the Bible. After that, we'll have another roundtable discussion, this time focusing around what traps churches often fall into. Finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Yeah, he will. Oh, yeah, he will. Momentous occasion. Um, once again, thank you for listening. We couldn't do the show without your support. We love you. Come back, drive safe, sleep well, and uh, see you next week. So, Christian, mm-hmm. I believe you're familiar with what happens after the show ends. Yes. Hmm. Do you think you can summarize today's show in under 10 seconds? Don't be afraid to ask questions you don't know the answer to. It's good. Did you practice that part? All off the cuff. Know. All right. Fair enough. All right. That's a good one. Three seconds. Not bad. Not bad at all. Um, <laughs> I abstain. So. <laughs> I've never led the pet peeves segment before. This is new territory yes. for me. Okay. <laughs>